السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه الأخيار المنتجبين وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد يقول الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بعد الكلام Continuing on our commentary on the chapter 112 of the Holy Quran The last time we talked about the different names of the surah We mentioned that there were more than 15, even 20 names of the surah that could be found in the literature of the Muslims. The most popular and the most prominent are the names Ikhlas and Tawheed. We also discussed um, the general content of the surah. We discussed the status of the surah, the greatness of it, that if someone were to recite it once, it is as if she recited one third of the Quran twice, then two-thirds of the Qur'an, three times then, as if one has recited the full Qur'an. It's a very, very valuable surah in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we also talked about the circumstances of its revelation, so some historical accounts. And then we branched a bit on discussing how can we know, how can we identify whether a surah is Mecki or Madani, whether a surah was revealed before the hijrah, before the migration to Medina or after it, some indicators that are generally uh, used in that context. And we finished with a bit of a summary of the content of the surah. Inshallah, we'll continue today. And this is a summary of a series of lectures that were delivered by Shaykh Haidar Hubbullah. May Allah bless him. And what I'm doing actually here is I'm uh, translating them and delivering them. I thought to give him the right credit. Today I will talk about the word Qul. Inshallah, today we'll just discuss Qul. Now, Qul means what in English? Say. Okay? Qul means say. Qul is mentioned in the Quran how many times? Over 300 times. The term Qul, the term say and a command. Yeah? 332 times to be precise. The derivatives of the verb to say in the Quran, they said, he said, they both said, you say, they say, right? All these kind of conjugations of the verb to say, or qul, or the verb qala, so qala, qala, yaquluna, qalu, all these are mentioned more than 1700 times in the Quran. So the term qul in that form, over 300 times. Now, there is a, a bit of a controversy about this word, by the way. And this is why I'm dedicating today's talk just for this word. Because there is a big controversy about it. A big controversy. Some of those who criticize the Quran, who criticize the revelation, they suggest that, well, look, Muhammad, as they say, we say, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They say, you know, there was an issue with the integrity of the Prophet Muhammad or of Muhammad. And that, you know, he was not very honest in the communication of the message because he included the word qul and he shouldn't have. I'll explain inshallah in a minute. For example, for example, if I say to my brother Musaddiq, I tell you, yes, I tell you, go or tell Farhad that Islam wants you to be a good person. Musaddiq, say to Farhad, Islam wants you to be a good person. So you are my messenger now to Farhad, delivering a message. Isn't that what we say about the Prophet? He's a messenger delivering a message. I tell Musaddiq, my messenger, tell Farhad, Islam wants you to be a good person. So what should Musaddiq say to Farhad? What should the message be? Should, Mus should Musaddiq say, 
say Islam wants you to be a good person, O oh Farhad? Or should Musaddiq say, Farhad, Islam wants you to be a good person? Do you see where the controversy now is? Another example. Okay, another example. I say, for example, MashaAllah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. It's a beautiful tasbih, wallahi. Allah bless, MashaAllah. So I say, for example, to Amina, I say to Amina, tell Zain that he has to pray. I tell Amina, my messenger, tell Zain that he has to pray. What should Amina go and tell Zain? Should she tell him, say to Zain, you have to pray? Or should she say, tell Zain, or Zain, he has to pray? Or should she say, oh Zain, you have to pray? Do you see now, do you understand where the controversy is? If the message itself still contains the word say, there's an issue here. Because the messenger usually has to translate the content what comes after say. But this was the point of those people who accused the Prophet ﷺ in that respect. Normally, we would, as messengers, we would eliminate the term say. If someone tells me, say something, I'd say the thing. I wouldn't say, say something. So this was their point. Now we go to the Prophet wasallam and we say, we go to the Qur'an. And we have listened to our dear beautiful brother, the verses of the Qur'an he recited. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, he, Allah, is one and only. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَاقِ Say, I seek refuge. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ Say, if you love Allah and his messenger, then follow me, Allah would love you. Or say, if you love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. So we see all these verses. What should the Prophet do then when he hears or when these are revealed to him? Should he not tell us, Allahu ahad? He is God, one and only. Should he not tell us, I seek refuge, birabbil falaq. I seek refuge in the Lord of Anas, the people, for example. Should he not have said that? Shouldn't that have been the surah or the message? So this is where the controversy starts. I'm spending time on this just to make sure that people understand what the controversy is. Maybe, you know, if any one of us faces that in the future. So you are aware of this. And so those critics who criticize the Prophet ﷺ, they suggest, they say, well, the Prophet was mistaken in relaying the message. And that this mistake not just happened once, it happened 332 times. The Prophet said, Qul, and he shouldn't have said, Qul. Okay? So this is why I'm dedicating today, inshallah, just for Qul. So there are answers, there are discussions, there are some propositions proposed or ideas proposed to answer, to address this accusation or this criticism. So I'll mention some of them. I'll mention six. The first two are not really, you know, they don't really hold water much. But I'll mention them. So this was proposed by the Qur'anists. The Qur'anists or Al-Qur'aniyun, you might have heard of uh, this, let me say, group of people or school from Muslims. Qur'anists are people who believe that the sunnah of the Prophet is not authoritative over us. What is authoritative over us is the Qur'an and only the Qur'an. So you go, you see the Qur'an. What did the Qur'an tell us? Pray, you pray. It didn't tell us 17 rak'ahs, pray like this, pray. No, 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 no. So you pray. Whatever you want to pray, you pray, right? If I'm understanding correctly, I hope I am not you know, misrepresenting. But generally, they believe that whatever narrations, reports that are attributed to the Holy Prophet, that he said this, that he has done this from the history outside the Qur'an, they say, no, that's not authoritative. We don't have to follow it. It's only the Qur'an. So these people try to answer this issue. They say, well, look, قُلْ Allah here is saying قُلْ because usually there are some people who came to the Prophet and asked him about things. And then the revelation said, okay, say this and this and that. And that's, that's a kind of an answer they, they provide. And they say, well, the sunnah of the Prophet, the true sunnah of the Prophet is the saying of the Prophet that comes after qul. So whatever the Prophet said, qul something, 
That thing is the sunnah that we should follow from the Quran, not from outside the Quran. Does this answer the question, by the way? Does this address the problem? That they say, you know, Allah said, Qul, in his message, because the Prophet would be addressing some other people's question. So this, does this answer the question of why did the Prophet include the term Qul in the message still? It tells us why did the revealer say Qul. It tells us why Allah said Qul, of course. But it doesn't tell us why the Prophet kept Qul in the message. So that really doesn't, doesn't address the question. But it is presented as addressing the question. It's very important. Sometimes, you know, you might see people giving answers, but you see the answer is very interesting, and you feel, yeah, it addresses the point. But actually, it doesn't. So we need to be very vigilant, making sure that it addresses the question that uh, we are after. Another idea suggested says that, well, Allah said, قُلْ in order to urge the Prophet, in order to encourage him to, you know, to move, to do something. Like when he said, Iqra. You know, he didn't, for example, just make him read. He said, read. Iqra, you know. It's like Allah is pushing the Prophet, is encouraging him. Again, the same, the, the same argument here. It's like, okay, fine. You are telling me now, why did Allah say, Qul? Okay, fine. But why did the Prophet keep, Qul, or say, why did he keep that word in the message? You're not answering the question. Right? Now a third answer. Pay attention to this. Isla, so that, that says that, look, let's consider the nature of the revelation. So the Quran is the revelation to the Prophet. That's what we believe, isn't it? Okay, let's consider this. Let's consider that revelation to the Prophet. What was revealed to the Prophet? What was revealed to the Prophet? There are four opinions. The first opinion is the majority opinion, the most popular opinion, is what? That the Qur'an that we have today, word by word, phrase by phrase, haraka by haraka, vowel by vowel, pause by pause, was revealed to the Prophet. So the Prophet heard it word by word, and he did not add, remove, alter, change any single thing. It's a message that he heard, that he experienced, he he heard, and that he revealed and mentioned to us. And the scribes, they wrote it, his companions. Right? So this is, again, the, there is almost a consensus amongst the Muslims that this is what happened. There is another opinion, not very popular, but says that, look, it is not the words that were revealed to the Prophet. What was revealed to the Prophet was the meanings. So the meanings were divine. The meanings of Allah is one and only. The meaning of Allah is Samad. He's, you know, he's the sustainer. Everyone needs him. He needs no one. Yes? The meaning of that he begets not, nor was he begotten. That meaning was revealed to him, was divinely revealed to him. But he put them in his own words. He happened to be Arab. And therefore, the Qur'an happened to be Arabic. If the Prophet was in China, this Qur'an would have been in Chinese, in a Chinese language, right? If he has been somewhere else, the Qur'an would have been the words of the Prophet as he understood them and he put them in his own words. So this theory, it is suggested that it's not a new theory, but in the modern time, some people like Abdul Karim Surush, if you've heard of him, that scholar, he proposes... This kind, of, this kind of theory. Now there is a criticism from the people of the first group, the majority of the Muslims, to this particular theory. They say, well, look, the Prophet heard every single word as it is, and he did not change anything. And the meanings and the words are from God, not just the meanings. No, no, the meanings and the words are from God. And they say that one evidence for this is that the Prophet kept the word Qul, kept the word say, because he's literally transmitting what he's hearing without removing the word say. So that's a proof of what? Of his integrity. So he did not alter anything. He was so particular about transmitting the message that he would not remove the word Qul and that he would not 
put the meanings or the words of his own understanding, because that would be lying. Some would say, look, if the Prophet was receiving the meanings and then he would be putting the words in his own way, then that would be lying. That would be what? That would be un untruthful. That would not be truthful. Do you agree with this, by the way? That if someone, if someone gives me a meaning of something and I put it in my words to transmit a message, does that necessarily mean that I'm lying or I'm not truthful or I'm not honest? So I'm not agreeing, by the way, with the second opinion. Or I'm, not, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with anything. But I'm saying this criticism. Because sometimes if we hear criticism, you say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, good, good, good. But does this criticism actually criticize? Is it, is it correct? Does it stand? Or do you have to find another criticism, actually? So for example, for example, yeah? Now we're talking. Now we're talking here. We're discussing. Someone after this talk tells you, okay, look, what did you hear today? What did you summarize? What did you learn today? What do you do? Summarize. You don't say it verbatim. You can't. Exactly. That's how humans work. Would you be lying then? Hmm. So would that be untruthful? So there could be a bias. Ah, uh -huh, very nice. Very nice. Okay. Anything else? Any other points? Very valid points, actually. Yes, Sayyid. Uh huh. Uh huh. Very good point. Very good point. And this happened actually in the reports of narrations sometimes. You know, the hadith from Fulan, from Fulan, from Fulan, from Fulan, from this, from this, that the Prophet said, for example. So sometimes, sometimes it happened that, well, the meaning changed. Yeah. But look, with the Prophet, it was just one link. One could argue that, look, the meaning was given to the heart of the Prophet once, and there was just one stage of translation of the meaning into words. So that doesn't have that problem of from person, from person, from person, so that it would deviate too much. Ah, I see, I see. I see. So the multiplicity, it, it allows it to magnify, but still, even if it happened once, there is a bias. Wonderful. Interesting. So the message might change, okay? That's, that's an interesting point. Look, so yes, you wouldn't be called a liar. If you say, you know, what you learned today. Unless you are expected to say the things verbatim. So for example, if I say, look, I don't forgive you if you tell people what you learned in your own words. You have to quote me verbatim, otherwise you're misquoting me. I have the right to say that. Yeah, you're misquoting me. You can't put words in my mouth. That's your understanding, for example. It's not my message. Uh, if there is a pre-agreement like this, then okay, understood. That yes, if someone changes and puts meanings or words in his own words, then okay, that might be an example of unfaithfulness or untruthfulness. Okay? But generally, this is how, you know, how people work. And this is how actually, you know, in narrations, there are some scholars that say, you are allowed to transmit a narration from the Prophet or the Imam by the meaning. Some suggest it's okay to do that. Assuming that you preserve the meaning, not that you, you know, you change the whole, the whole meaning altogether. So this is because there's an understanding that people work like this. So, that cannot be a criticism towards those people who say, you know, the Prophet put the meanings in his words, and therefore you say like, yeah, that's not truthful from the Prophet. Then otherwise he would be lying if he did that. No, you can't say that. If you want to criticize their idea, you have to find another excuse, another way. Okay? After? Okay, inshallah. Right. Another example. The Qur'an itself, the Qur'an itself, sometimes, talks about some events, some incidents. It says that Musa said A, B, C, D. In another verse, it talks about the same incident. And it says, Musa said A, B, C, D, E, F. Or A, B, E, F. So it changes. 
Does that mean that the Quran is then not truthful or Quran is lying? Because it transmitted, seemingly, apparently, it transmitted the sayings of Musa by meaning. So that's an example, that's an evidence to say, well, you look, you cannot accuse the people of the second theory that if the Prophet did it, then he's lying. That's, that doesn't apply. So their theory that, look, if he did it, he still is not lying, that holds. It doesn't necessarily mean he was lying. Again, I'm not agreeing with that theory, but if you want to accuse, if you want to say that, ah, if the Prophet put things in his own words, then he's lying, if you want to criticize that, bring a better evidence. That's what I want to say. Okay? Because the Quran did it. Example. Chapter 27, verse 7. إِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِأَهْلِهِ so Moses said to his family, so remember these quotes, remember, okay? I'll mention three ways how this was mentioned in the Quran, differently. Quran chapter 27 verse 7. When Moses said to his family, I have spotted a fire, I will either bring you some directions from there, or a burning torch, so you may warm yourselves. Quran chapter 20 verse number 10. He said to his family, wait here, I have spotted a fire. Perhaps I can bring you a torch from it or find some guidance at the fire. That's the same event. How is God telling us two different quotations? Two different phrases. It means that the Quran apparently is transmitting by meaning. But we wouldn't call it lying. Quran chapter 28 verse 29. He said to his family, stay here, I have spotted a fire. Perhaps from there I can bring you some directions or a torch from the fire so that you may, so that you may warm yourselves. So again, a third form of that phrase, okay? So we wouldn't say the Quran is being untruthful in that sense. It seems that transmitting by meaning is okay. Also, some prophets are non-Arab, right? Some prophets are not Arab. They didn't speak Arabic. But the Quran said... In the Quran, there is like, and Yusuf said. And the Quran is speaking in Arabic. And it is saying, for example, that Yusuf said some Arabic words. But he didn't say Arabic. He said things in some other language. I don't know, maybe Hebrew, for example. So it seems that the Quran found it okay that it translates the meaning and says it in Arabic. The Quran didn't quote verbatim what Yusuf said in his language and put it in the Quran there. No. It actually translated it in Arabic and presented it to us. So the Qur'an is doing also this transmission by meaning. So you can't criticize those people saying, you know, that, well, your theory doesn't hold water because otherwise the Prophet would be lying. Not necessarily. The Prophet would not be lying. He would be transmitting by meaning. Again, I'm not necessarily agreeing with this theory, but if you want to criticize it, find another evidence. And there are. There are other ways of criticizing. I think, as I'll mention also, it will be clear that I'll be supporting the first theory. That the Prophet actually is transmitting everything as he heard. So the argument is that. So what did we mention? We mentioned, I said, considering the revelation, there are four theories. One says that the Prophet transmitted what he heard exactly, word by word, phrase by phrase, vowel by vowel, pause by pause, every single thing. Exactly as he heard it. Second theory, that the Prophet received the divine meanings. And he understood them very, very well. And he put them in his words in a very accurate manner. Okay? That's another theory. A third theory is similar to the second one. But it says that, well, the meaning was divine, translate, transmitted to Jibra'il, and Jibra'il put them in the words. So it was Jibra'il that put them in words. But still the Prophet transmitted what he heard from Jibra'il. The fourth, so I will not discuss the third and the fourth. The fourth is that the words and the meanings are from the Prophet himself. And Allah allowed him to do so and supported him to do so. Okay? Because he reached a stage of perfection, a certain level where he is able to compose, so to speak, this divine meaning that he, let's say, was inspired by. So obviously this is not to say the least, it's not a popular opinion. Right, so considering the term Qul, now you understand why I mentioned these four opinions. Because according to the first opinion, the Prophet heard the word Qul in Qul huwa Allahu Ahad and he gave it to us as a block. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, I don't change it. Right? 
I don't change it. So that was the third explanation of Qul. Why Qul is there in the message? Why Qul remained? The word say remained in the Quran. Why, why did the Prophet not remove it? Okay, that's the third explanation. The fourth explanation is that it's emphasis for emphasis. Not very much, um, you know, not very relevant actually. It doesn't explain much. Another, a, four, a fifth opinion. Why does the message still say Qul? Why does the Quran still contain Qul? Why did the Prophet not remove the word Qul? This theory says that actually it is a way that God refuses to descend to the level of those people, the kafirin, the disbelievers, to speak directly to them. And therefore he would say to the Prophet, look, you tell them. As if, you know, God is, let's say, elevated. God is, um, um, what do you say, Allahumma sallam, Allah Muhammad, is exalted, is too exalted to be speaking to the disbelievers directly. And so... The Prophet relays the message as it is. And he says, well, God, my God says, say God is one, for example. Or say, oh, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ Say, oh, disbelievers. It's a way that God wants to dissociate himself from those people, indicating that he does not want to give them any value, any honor of being, for example, spoken to directly, and therefore he's telling the Prophet, you tell them. Any thoughts, by the way? Do you agree with this? Let me know. That the Prophet kept the word Qul because God wants to indicate that he doesn't want to, you know, kind of, that's an impolite way of expressing it, that he would descend to the level of those people. He doesn't want to give them value, and therefore he would tell the Prophet, okay, you say to them, those disbelievers. Huh. So that would put the messenger as well on par with the kafirin. So that's not a valid argument then. Very beautiful. Ahsan. Any other points? Any other thoughts? Uh -huh. So you mean to say, let me, correct me if I'm paraphrasing wrongly, okay? You mean probably to say that the people who are addressed, yes, the people who are addressed by the Qur'an are the kafirun then, in that context, but not necessarily for the rest of the time to receive that message. Uh -huh. Ah, so it's, okay, I see. Right, so the Qur'an is a book that was revealed not... For all the humans till the day of judgment, not only for the Prophet himself to say something. So even us, we have to say. Beautiful. Very good point. Thank you, Hassan. Any other thoughts? Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Yes, sorry, yes. Uh -huh. I see. So what you're saying now is an evidence to support the theory of those first people, first group of people that the Prophet did not change anything. I agree. But with the problem that I'm having now is some suggest that the Prophet kept the word Qul because God does not want to speak to the disbelievers directly. And therefore, he is asking the Prophet, okay, you say it to them. Does that hold water? What do you think? Think out loud, it's fine. I can see expressions on your faces, but say them. Why do you think it's strange? You mentioned one reason, Ahsan Tullah. Why do you think? What, what other reasons there could be? Yes. Probably holds water, uh-huh.
but probably holds water because speaking directly to someone who rejects the message is probably degrading, diminishing to the message. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so she's saying that, look, she's heard of verses saying, amanu, or you who believe, being directed, being spoken to directly, but not necessarily, or you who disbelieve. Surprise for you. There is. Ya ahl al-kitab, O people of the book. So, ya ibadi, excellent. Qul ya ibadi. There are multiple places in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet to speak to whom? To his beloved servants. To his beloved servants. I'll mention, I'll mention some examples. Say to the believers, min absarihim, that they may lower their gaze, right? Say to the believers. So no, says who that God does not want to, you know, descend to the level of the kafir. Who says that Qul, or the Prophet is talking to the kafirin, to the disbelievers only? No, he's talking to the believers as well. He's talking to the elite believers as well. Qul li azwajika. O Prophet, say to your wives, وَبَنَاتِكَ and your daughters, وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ the women of the mu'mineen. Okay? So some suggest, well, okay, look, my God says, يَا أَيُّهَا and usually يَا أَيُّهَا means like, oh, you who are far. So God is saying to the kafirin, you're far from me. You, يَا أَيُّهَا oh, you who are, for example, disbelieving. Again, God says, يَا أَيُّهَا for the believers. So that was a partial view. It seems that those who proposed this theory, they didn't, or they forgot parts of the Quran. Okay? Some verses speak to people in general as well. Ya ayyuhan nas. Oh, you people. So does God want to not talk to the people? Is he disliking? Is he has, does he have a problem with people? And then he's saying, the Prophet, you talk to them. I don't want to talk to them directly, for example. So that's also problematic. In some verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the kafirun directly. Without qul, ya ayyuhal kafirun. Without saying that to the Prophet, look, you... Say to the kafirun, O oh, disbelievers. You say, O oh, disbelievers. No, no, sometimes Allah says in the speech is addressed to the disbelievers directly. Ya ahl al kitab, for example. Qul. There's no qul ya ahl al kitab. There's ya ahl al kitab. Immediately. So Allah is addressing people directly who are, let's say, non believers in the message. So, in many contexts also, qul is used without having to be in a context of the Prophet talking to someone. Can you give me an example of God saying to saying in the message, in the Quran, saying, قُلْ But it's not necessarily that the Prophet has to talk to someone else. It's just you say. No. So this one, you tell my servants. Ah, uh, no. That actually might apply. Yes. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا But again, it might, be, it might be addressing some other people. Is there no example of qul, but without any conversation between the Prophet and someone else? Huh? Qul a'udhu. Qul a'udhu. Say, I seek refuge. It's just something personal with God. I seek refuge in God. He's not talking to anyone. Qul wa qul rabbi. Zidni ilma. Rabbi shrah li sadri. There's no qul there, actually. There's no qul. No, no. Rabbi shrah li sadri, there's no qul. Yes, it's a dua from Musa. But qul, rabbi zidni, ilma. Okay, so there is qul here, but there's no conversation. So anyway, this argument is not very powerful. It's not very strong. That, you know, qul is there because Allah wants the Prophet to speak on his behalf, because Allah does not want to directly speak to the disbelievers. There's many problems with this argument, evidently. The last theory I want to mention is that, inshallah, I'll finish with this. And conclude. What is the Quran? We ask ourselves, what is the Quran? Is the Quran a book of science only? It's like a book of science. Is it a book of maths? There is numbers in it. Is it a book of maths? Is it a book of history? There is history in it. But is it a book of history? There are stories in it. But is it a book of stories? There are beliefs, explanations of beliefs in it. But is it a book of beliefs? Right? There are parables in it. There are lessons in it. Is it a book of parables? Is it, for example, a book of information? There are information in it. But is it a book of just information? 
the Quran is not an exclusive book of it. The Quran is a comprehensive book. Well, it has, yes, it does have exhortations. It does have reminders. The Quran contains lessons. The Quran contains parables. The Quran contains beautiful stories. The Quran contains information. It contains ethical instructions and recommendations. It contains beliefs. It contains ahkam, rulings on how to do this, how not to do that. It does contain all of these. Yeah? So the Quran is comprehensive in these matters. We noticed that the Quran did not reach us like some of those books that we read today, where, you know, someone sits, gathers her thoughts, you know, mind storms, what do you say, brainstorms, yes, writes some ideas, like, for example, okay, look, God is one because uh, A, B, C, D, and look, you have to pray, prayers is wajib, and the wudu is like this, you do wudu before salat, and, you know, if you don't do salat, Allah would not like you, and it, is it written like that? Like someone would write a book where you have organized thoughts, for example, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, you have a flow of ideas and thoughts. And is it written in this way? We notice that it is not. It does not reach us in that, in that way. We notice that it has different styles inside it. I'll mention examples. Different styles, which makes it a bit a unique kind of book. A very unique kind of book. Very, very unique. For example, styles, okay? God sometimes speaks in the first person. In that Quran, God speaks in the first person. Examples, 16, verse 51. And fear me. Oh, my servants. It's like God is talking. Oh, my servants, fear me, obey me. I have not created, you know, this kind of way. First person, okay, that's the style. And then soon, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about God in the third person. Like what? Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, he. God is one. He, he. Third person. Absent. Allahu samad. That's a style. Another style. Allahu la ilaha illa hu. Ah. God, there's no God but he. Okay, he speaks in the first, third person. Another style. God would be, for example, speaking directly to the people, not through the prophet, that the prophet say, but no, no, God directly talking to the people. Am turiduna an tas'alu Musa. For example, chapter 2, verse 108. Do you want to ask Moses? Do you want to ask your messenger like Moses was asked before? So Allah is directly speaking to the people. Another style. Allah is speaking to the prophet about people. He's speaking to the Prophet, or oh, Prophet, if they, if they, for example, denied you. It's like the verses are addressing the Prophet as a person. Yeah? Example, chapter 6, verse 147. Another style, Allah would be speaking to the Prophet about the Prophet himself. Allah is speaking to the Prophet about the Prophet himself. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ Illa Rasul. Allah is speaking, revealing to the Prophet, revealing to Prophet Muhammad, saying, Look, Muhammad is none but a messenger. That's a style as well. Another style. Allah is speaking to him about him but addressing others. So imagine you are imagine you are in the place of the Messenger of God and you're coming to tell people a messenger from yourselves has come to you. These are the words of God talking to people about the messenger himself. That's another style. Right? Chapter 9, verse 128. Sometimes the verses or the Quran will be moving from the singular to the plural. Talking in the singular you know, form, then to the plural form. Example, chapter 33, verse 33. We all, alhamdulillah, memorize this. Yes? Talking. To the women of the Prophet. And in the end of it, it says, She's so saying first, settle in your houses. Houses. In the end of the verse, it says, Allah wants to purify you, the people of the house. Some say, well, you know, it's it's uh, it's, it's you know, it's Allah, you know, saying, 
Explain to me why did God move from plural to singular in one verse? Sometimes it moves from the feminine form to the masculine form in the same verse, this verse that I mentioned. He would be talking to the ladies, وَقَرْنَا فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّا Oh, you women, you women, you women, you women. And in the end it says, Allah wants to purify you as a group of masculine and feminine pronouns. It changed. What's happening there? Another form, I'll finish with this one from the forms. Another style, moving from what? From the absent to the present. Remember Surah Al-Fatiha. What do we say? Alhamdulillahi. Praise be, belongs to God. We're not talking to God here. Yeah? We're talking about God. Praise belongs to God. The Lord of the worlds. Yes? Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The most merciful. The Lord of the worlds. The owner of the day of judgment. And then what? You we obey. And you we worship. What happened then? Once God was in the third person. And then the next verse, he became the second person we're talking to. So that's a change in style. In summary, what I want to say is that if we look at the Quran, it does not seem to be written in a style of someone like us would compose a book, would compose a letter, or would compose a piece of, let me say, literature. It appears like someone composed this book, composed this letter, and gave it to the Prophet as a package, said, look, deliver this. You deliver this as one package, one report, one book. The style is not a human style. That's what it appears to be. And so the word qul there is beco becomes reasonable, becomes part of all this, you know, all this package. So if the Prophet made a mistake the first time that he mentioned qul in the revelation, why over 23 years the revelation did not correct him to say, well, look, look, you said qul there, don't say qul now, skip it. It happened 332 times that he said qul and the revelation was fine, you know, he was not corrected. It seems to be that this qul is part of this package because qul is another style in the Qur'an. Another example of these styles in the Qur'an. So, qul, the word qul or say, is another style of expression in addition to what we have mentioned. And this mention, this was mentioned over 300 times, likely to signify that the text is not from the Prophet himself. But actually, he is only a medium, he's only a messenger, he does not have any authority to change anything from it, omit, add, remove, alter, anything. He's only a transmitter who is not bringing anything from himself. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifoon wa salamun ala al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salawat. Do we have the microphone at all? It might be a bit echoey. But yeah. it, doesn't have, it doesn't have everything in it. Well, we always believe the Quran has everything in it. It's up to you to find it. It's up to you to ponder on every word and every sentence. Am I mistaken? Or, uh... Could you repeat the first part of the question? I didn't catch it. Sorry. The first part was that I got the impression what you said earlier on, the Quran doesn't have everything in it. Doesn't have everything in it. No, yeah. I didn't. I don't remember no, I said that. No, maybe that's why I'm confusing you. Know, that's why I'm, I want you to clarify this. You know. No, I don't remember yeah. I said that. So the Quran is the book that was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa yeah. It is clarifying of everything. Yes, it has treasures from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Yes, yeah. and so, yes, we have. So, so it is a complete book in every sense. Of yes. The word, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It is a manifestation of the real divine manifest or divine entity, divine reality of the book, and this was manifested and revealed within 23 years of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, compiled between two covers as phrases and words and sentences. Yes, we have a question there. Any other questions on the sister side? Yeah, would, do you want the microphone or are you happy this way? 
Yeah, you're happy. Okay, you're happy. Okay. So the Quran was revealed. We read it, and they always compare the Quran to the Bible. Who compares the Quran to the Bible? People. Okay. Okay. So although it's one book, people have different interpretations of it, right? Right, okay, right. So, okay, let me, let me clarify the differences here. So first, in our perception, our belief that the Bible, or what we have today of the New Testament, the difference between that and the Qur'an is that we say that the Qur'an is actually the words that the Prophet himself he uttered. The New Testament, there is no claim that Jesus himself uttered those. It is actually the disciples later, the, the students, they composed them. From their understanding of what Jesus might have said, right? So it's similar to the hadith corpus of what we have. The Qur'an is the word of God. That's what we believe. There wasn't, so the companions were writing what Muhammad said directly in his lifetime. Not like, the gospel, not like the gospel or like, you know, the New Testament that they were compiled or written after Jesus left. That's one difference. Yes? So the New Testament is already written as the people's or disciples' interpretation. Already. But the Qur'an, no. The words are not interpretation. The words are, we believe, the words of God. Now, we go to the second level. People who experience the gospel and people who experience, let me say the, the, the New Testament, if that's a correct um, explanation, um, expression, and the people who experience the Quran. Those who are experiencing the New Testament, they are experiencing the experiences of the true gospel, the true, the true Bible. But those who are experiencing the Quran, they are experiencing the word of God directly. That's the difference. Second is that, yes, the interpretation of, we have our interpretation, we have our own understanding, that's correct. But we need to make sure that we refer to the people of knowledge. This is what we believe, that they are the Prophet himself. The Prophet was sent to communicate to us this message and not just leave us. Look, this is the book, go and live. No, he was explaining it for us. Tibyan, yeah? لِتُبَيِّنَ nas. Allah says in the Quran that, look, we sent you so that you clarify to the people what was revealed to them. The Prophet had a responsibility of clarifying the book. Because the book, without an explainer or a clarifier, it's not sufficient for us. The deficiency is in ours, in, is in us, actually. The, com the book is complete, the book is light, the book is clarifying and manifesting, but it's our issue, it's our weakness that we need a teacher. That's where we believe that, you know, we need the Prophet. We need someone after the Prophet, who's from the light of the Prophet, from the knowledge of the Prophet, to teach us the book. That's what we believe in Amir al-Mu'mineen, in Imam Ali, in the, in the next Imams. We believe in their Imamat because of their knowledge. Not because, you know, the Imam has to be a ruler of the Muslim lands. No, 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 no. It is about teaching us the message of the Prophet, continuing the mission of the Prophet, which is explaining this book, right? Helping us understand it. Yeah? This is where we try to actually go and learn, go and see what these people, you know, what did they say about the Quran. We try to understand it. Not to eliminate your personal experiences, of course, not to eliminate them, but because we could be biased by our ignorances, by our, you know, by different factors. But those people, their knowledge is pure. They know the depths of it. I hope I addressed your question, by the way, about the differences. Any other questions? Do you have a question? Any questions there? Any comments? Any objections? No, everyone happy, inshallah. Any objections here? Yes, we have. Okay, sorry. Because I kind of know Suraj, Abdul Kim Suraj. I have a criticize I, I, on his idea. Uh, he says, okay, because the prophet was in so, 
Arabic. He talking in Arabic. So, so sorry, you're talking about the idea that the Prophet received the meanings divinely and he put the meanings in his words. Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna anzalnahu qur'anan arabiyan la anna kutaba we revealed the qur'an Arabi, in arabic that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed qur'an actually in arabic mm -hmm. there is no translation here there is no uh, explanation here this is what how it came and another point i wanted to mention can i tell you something yeah those people might tell you look the term arabi means clear doesn't necessarily mean the language arabic that might be an answer that you might receive, but I, I agree with you. And another point, when uh, we've been in school, I'm talking about we feel that difference between ourselves and teacher or president of the school or madras. And for example, president asks us, okay, go and say to your teacher, uh, you dismiss and you can go home, something happened. Never we go and tell our teacher, class is dismissed. Let, let everyone go. Because teacher said, who are you? You are just a student like others. Why are you asking me to do? We will say to the teacher, that the, principal. the president asked me to come and say to you, the class is dismissed. Mm -hmm. Or for example, the class changed the hour. And because this student, in this particular moment, holy prophet, look at himself as an insignificant, uh -huh. insignificant and invaluable Thing. comparing to who carrying the mm. message he don't uh, he does not have even the he yeah. don't give his uh, the authority to himself mm. to change the message mm. he says what is coming right okay the president told me he even mentioned this part the president told me to say this to you okay you know mm. because because he knows who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because he knows with he all of his, uh, you know, greatness is insignificant in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, he don't change anything. He say, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I say this to you, done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, after that he come and explain to people what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually wants from them. But in the time of, you know, in the time he, he revealed the Quran, he recited the Quran for them. He said, okay, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have authority to change it. This is what it is. There's a verse that says exactly this. Um, something I wouldn't, it's not from myself to change or to alter or to bring. Because sometimes they would tell the Prophet, huh? They would tell him, for example, you know, bring us something now. And he said, it's not my, it's not like I want to, I invent whatever I want. It's, it's God's revelation. So I have to wait, <laughs> you know. And uh, I don't have the authority to change anything. Yes. Ahsan. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions? Sorry. We have. Ah, okay. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Please recite salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.